And, and B's right. We're we're having a moment where an interesting thing is happening where people say, this is not in that bill. And it is absolutely in that. So let's for a moment back up and talk about what are in these bills. And let's let's back up to the regular session, because right now we're in special session. Uh, and we want to back up to the regular session to kind of review where we've been real quick. During the regular session, there were more than 360 bills filed that we monitored just on voting rights. They weren't all bad, um, but 360 is a high volume uh, for bills on this particular issue. We ended up having to very closely monitor up to 80 different pieces of legislation that were active and live threats meaning that they were either bad or these bills could have been amended at the last minute to go bad. Uh, and uh, these 80 different bills passed out of at least one committee somewhere in the process. And many of these bills had more than one provision, right? What did that one bill do? Well, a lot of these bills had multiple provisions. Uh, and then you had situations where uh, you had one bad provision or one bad idea in multiple bills, and then you had a situations where, where bills had multiple provisions. And so we're talking about roughly, uh, you know, 100 different provisions we could talk about that touched or affected voting rights negatively in some way, shape, or form. So we're really just going to cover the top of the top. But I want you to have an idea of just how big it's talking about, because people say, well, what is your issue with this bill? It's death by a thousand cuts. Uh, is the best way to think about it. And, I, and I've seen that metaphor used. I want to kind of do a little thing with that metaphor here towards the end of the presentation, but, but keep that in mind, the idea of death by a thousand cuts. So we should have handed out to you this thing that's called the top 10 things wrong with Senate Bill 1 and House Bill 3. Those are the current bill numbers for what the big omnibus voting rights bill that everyone's talking about. In the regular session, it was Senate Bill 7. Uh, so you may hear me say Senate Bill 7, that was the regular sessions bill. Uh, the current ones are Senate Bill 1 and House Bill 3. Uh, where they are different, we have attempted to, to note that in this, in this four-page thing. On this four-page thing, the first page is a summary. So in 25 words or less, what is the problematic provision and why is it problematic? Then if you turn the page, uh, you will notice there's a 1 through 10 again. This is going into more detail about each one of these provisions, and I do want to go through these provisions a little bit. Uh, in detail because there is such a conversation about, well, that's not in the bill. Well, let's talk about what's in this bill. And, and you'll notice that I put, you know, we're people of faith and whether you're Jewish, Muslim, or, or, or Christian, we all like chapter and verse. So where is it? Well, here's the chapter and verse of in the bill of where it is. Happy to point out to you, point it to you where it is. Let's talk about what we think. Uh, well, let's just start with number one, poll watchers. Both of these bills would empower partisan poll watchers to intimidate, harass, and disrupt. So the bills expressly provide for free movement anywhere in the polling location for poll watchers. Watchers would be able to look into the cars of curbside voters. They would, it would endanger a voter's personal information and threaten secrecy of the ballot. The bills also would require election judges to personally observe the disruptive behavior. And then the judge could only, the poll worker is only able to issue, they have to issue one warning before they can remove somebody. So we were joking like everybody gets one felony for free. It's a little extreme example, but that's kind of where we're at. The other big problem is that a voter would not be able to file a complaint with the election judge. So again, if the judge didn't see it, the voter can't come up and say, hey, I want to file a complaint about this thing that just happened. The judge has to see it. And here's one of the big things I really want to stress. Not everything that's disruptive is illegal, right? So you can have a 15-minute argument in good faith. But when that 15-minute argument happens three, four, five times, at what point is it disruptive? And at what point can the election judge remove the poll watcher? And here's the really critical thing. Every 15 minute argument means that you have one election worker not working the election, but sidelined arguing with the poll watcher. That means the line is going to get longer and long lines disenfranchise. Election judges, provision two. 
There are numerous criminal and civil penalties that leave judges in fear for their personal liberty and property. We're going to come back to this in a little bit, but I wanted to make sure I make mention of it as we go through what's in the bill. Three, exposing personal information. Signature verification committees would be able to take home the notes that they keep with them, the notes that they keep during, the, during their administration of it. This is a real problem. Those notes should stay with the county and with the official election records. That just makes sense. But additionally, if you let people take home people's personal sensitive information that they've seen on a mail-in ballot, that's going to open up those voters to, to intimidation and harassment later. It also just endangers your personal identification and uh, identity theft. For the personal ID number that people keep talking about with mail-in ballots, the way these bills are written, and again, this is the, the devils in the details, right? The way these bills are written, when you did your voter registration application, you put down some number. Do you remember if you put down your driver's license number? Or did you put down your social security number? And how sure are you? I did mine over a decade ago. I don't remember. The way this is written, the number you used for your registration, the number you used for your application to vote by mail, and then the number you use on the ballot itself, not the ballot itself, but the carrier envelope that keeps the ballot. All three have to match. If they do not match, it's kicked out. Again, which one did you use when you registered? No idea. So the county election administrators tell us that over a million voters are affected by this. And if you want to learn more about it, there's a great Texas Monthly article on this. Five, signature verification. Signature verification is a pseudoscience. It's a junk science uh, in the rules of evidence in Texas for legal purposes. Nevertheless, we use it for voting. This bill would expand its use. It would say any signature on file could be looked at and examined. That could be your driver's license signature from 25 years ago when they had that slippery first generation touchpad that you signed. You know, you remember those that you slide all over the place? You're like, that's not my signature. In addition to that, you have age. People get signatures change when you get older. You can take medication that causes you to have a signature change. You can have a medical condition that causes your signature to change. It's going to expand the use of a thing that's already pretty dubious. Six, fixing mistakes. The, the technical term that you'll hear voting rights people talk about is the opportunity to cure a mistake. Cure, C-U-R-E, uh, but this is fixing mistakes on a mail-in ballot. The biggest problem with these provisions, and right now, something is better than nothing, let's be, let's be honest, but because right now the voter has no opportunity to cure whatsoever. Your ballot's just rejected. But the way that that's written, it's going to force those that already have mobility issues. Because let's think about in Texas, you have to have an excuse to vote by mail. That means you have to be 65 or older, or you are disabled are the two most common reasons. Those two demographics already have mobility issues. And so forcing them to drive downtown to provide identification is at best extremely onerous. And at worst, many people can't. But the way that these cure provisions would work, you'd have to actually travel downtown to do it in person. Seven, canceled ballots. So every single election, a number of mail-in ballots get lost in the mail. This happened to several Texas Impact members uh, over the 2020 cycle. Now, in many cases, if you notice it in time, you can cancel your mail-in ballot with the county. The county will cancel that mail-in ballot so that if it's received back and they scan it in with their barcode, they see that that's not a ballot and gets kicked out. And if you properly cancel your ballot, you're then allowed to go in person and vote. What the provision in Senate Bill 1 does is it says you must vote provisional even if you properly cancel the mail-in ballot. Provisional ballots are less likely to get counted. This is unnecessary, especially when you've properly gone through the cancellation process. Eight, voter purges. There's a provision in Senate Bill 1 that, uh, in the name of cleaning up the voter rolls, a thing we can all want to be for, it's the way they go about doing it. It would cancel voters based on motor vehicle records and responses to jury summons. Let's get into the weeds of this a little bit. College kids, people in the armed services, oil field workers. These are people who, they don't move once and for all. They may be transient. They may be temporarily moved. 
all sorts of uh, workers these days have this issue. And a very truthful response, I mean, so I should mention and back up and say, in addition to if you get flagged by one of these database checks, uh, you're going to be referred to the Attorney General's Office for Criminal Investigation. A truthful response to a jury summons that you're not residing at your voter registration address is not evidence of a criminal offense. It just means you're possibly a college kid. So, for instance, you're a college kid. Let me back up and say it confuses two legal concepts that are super important. Domicile and residence. Right? So, for instance, I'm a college kid. My parents live in Dallas. For purposes of domicile, that's where I effectively live. I am away at college living there for nine months, but I, for all, don't, I'm going to move each year to a new apartment. My domicile is my home where my parents live. My temporary residence is wherever I'm at in college in my apartment. I may very well want to keep my voter registration in Dallas County. But if I get that jury summons from Dallas County and I read it, and I'm a college kid and I'm busy and I'm 18 and I don't think through consequences, and I read it and I get to the very first excuse that says, I'm not a resident of the county, and I check that box. And I didn't read down 10 more boxes to where it says you're exempt if you're a college student. And you check the wrong box, your voter registration may get canceled. And then you may be referred for criminal prosecution, even though you've done nothing legally wrong. Nine, vote harvesting. It creates a brand new, vague criminal penalty. And I say it's vague because many of us that, that represent membership organizations cannot tell what specific activity is, is, is permissible versus what's criminal. So we did a thing, uh, we did a project uh, during the 2020 election where we had 25 congregations get everybody 65 and older applications to vote by mail. Also, membership organizations, nonprofits all the time can take positions on ballot initiatives. So think about the constitutional amendment election coming up. Uh, Baptists don't like gambling, right? If we were expanding gambling, they would sure have a position and legally absolutely could on, on the expansion of gambling. Something like that. We've ever had a position on uh, low-income water uh, projects and a, pro a constitutional amendment for that. Happens all the time. So if we have a position on a ballot measure and we pass out and distribute applications to vote by mail, the way we read this bill, we'd be felons. 10, voter assistance. Senate Bill 1 and House Bill 3 both would make voting harder for those who are disabled or have language barriers and need somebody to help them. These provisions in the bill, they're all criminal penalties and oaths and perjury. Uh, they have a discriminatory effect on communities of color that already have a fear of police or have members, uh, family members that are non-citizens. That's what's currently in the bill. I do want to spend a couple minutes to talk about the scary provisions that are not currently in the bill, but at one time were, uh, or were in other bills. And the reason I want to do this is because nothing is ever really dead in this building until Sonny die the last day, until they are out of town without a further day to meet. So for instance, Senate Bill 7, the bill from the regular session, when it came back from conference committee, so again, a bill goes through two chambers. If the bills are not identical, it goes to a conference committee. This is uh, five members of each cha uh, chamber get appointed to negotiate their differences. When it came back from conference committee, it came back with 50 new pages, 50 pages longer than when it went into conference committee of brand new language that no one had seen. And everybody had 48 hours to look at before they voted on it. Nothing's really ever dead in this building the last day. So it's worth revisiting a number of the things that, that are not currently in the bill, but we have concerns that could come back at any moment. Souls of the polls. There was a provision in Senate Bill 7 that said uh, you can't have, uh, it would, counties can't, do, uh, can't open up their polling locations until after 1 p.m. on Sunday. It was aimed at souls of the polls. There was another provision that made it easier to overturn elections in court. There was a provision redefining what it means to be disabled. Now, the disability definition was ruled on by the Texas Supreme Court. The Texas Supreme Court said it is up to the voter to decide whether or not you are disabled. Members, some 
particular legislators didn't like that, so they want to take it out of your hands and redefine what that means, which would then create a whole new round of litigation, presumably. Another provision required you to prove disability by producing a doctor's note. And then another provision allowed poll watchers to record with their cell phones all the activity going on in a polling location. And there were no criminal penalties if they violated the secrecy of your ballot. They're not supposed to, but there was no penalty. No penalty. Is the law really any good? Let's talk about other bills. Did any of you vote by mail? Did any of you hand deliver your mail-in ballot? Yeah, um, there was a bill to prevent you from doing that. There was no good security argument for it. In fact, when you went and hand delivered your mail-in ballot, you presented photo ID, which presumably makes it more secure than if you just did it by mail. It's simply that they just didn't like that you did it. This same author also had a bill to shorten the ballot receipt deadline. So in other words, uh, currently in Texas, that if you get it in the mail before election day, and really you need to do it a week before, but if it arrives the day after, they'll count it. This would have shortened it to the end of the early voting period. It was cutting four days off the ballot receipt deadline. It was, there was no good security reason for doing this. It was just going to increase the number of ballot rejections. Uh, there was another bill to uh, criminalize the handing out of applications for voter by mail, period. Just said, we don't like that third parties are doing this. We're going to make it illegal to hand out this government document. There was a bill for armed election judges to allow election judges to carry guns in the polling location. That one got through the House. And there was a fifth, well, there's another bill that centralized, a couple bills actually, that centralized voter registration at the Secretary of State's office. They took it away from the counties and gave it to the Secretary of State to administer. These are just a few examples of bills that were out there. So I want to take this moment to now transition. Um, we've talked about what was in the bills. We've talked about what's currently in this bill. I want to go back to this idea of death by a thousand cuts. I don't disagree with that. That's not my words. I read that in a news article. I don't disagree with it. I'd like to think about it a little different, though. I'd like for us not to confuse two concepts. There's the concept of erosion and the concept of collapse. And while they are related, they are different. So when I was a kid, about four or five years old, my grandfather bought uh, some land in deep east Texas in the woods. It was a heavily wooded area. And he cut trails. Uh, and we would, uh, he would put us in a trailer. And, and when I say tractor, it was really a Ford right on lawnmower, but we called it the tractor. And he would pull us around in the trailer on these trails. And the way the property was is that it had this little small creek that kind of prevented you from being able to do a perfect circle. You would have to kind of come back to the place you did. So he was a World War II vet, super handy with his hands, really good with tools. In fact, he built a house on this property by himself. Um, so he built a bridge across this little creek. But water is a powerful force, right? And no matter how good your bridge is, you're going to have erosion problems. You have to maintain your bridge. And with time and rain, erosion occurs, the wood rots. You've got to check this bridge. Because if you don't check this bridge and your tractor goes across it with the kids in the back of the trailer and it collapses, that's a disaster. So you've got to shore it up periodically. You've got to brace it. You've got to support it. You've got to put in you know, two-by-sixes and make sure that the dirt hits the two-by-sixes. And you may have to go dig some dirt from over here and refill it over here. And you've got to maintain it from time to time. And we did. I remember doing these projects every couple of years with them. But we got older. And when I say we, I mean my grandfather is now 98 years old. Um, I live four hours away in Austin, Texas, not one hour away in Dallas like I used to. Uh, we go, went to college. We got jobs. I have my own children. It, we don't get down there like we used to. The bridge got neglected. It eroded. And a big rain took it away. I don't remember the exact design of that bridge. I have a memory of it in my head. I have a picture of it in my head. I could not tell you exactly what was where and at what degree angle and how many and what not. I, if I even remember it, I don't have the skill with tools. Uh, my grandfather's father, my great-grandfather, built bridges for the U.S. highway system during the New Deal. That's institutional knowledge that's lost. 
So we're going to talk now about how to shore up that bridge, that bridge being a metaphor for democracy. There will absolutely be an election in 2022. There's nothing in any of these bills that contemplates not having an election in 2022. In fact, we're going to have an election in November of this year, 2021, actually. It's the Constitutional Amendment election, and we'll have a couple of them in 2022. This isn't a crisis that will be over tomorrow, even in a best-case scenario, right? And, and frankly, there's never a once-and-for-all fix. This is a problem of having a bridge and erosion that requires periodic work. Good news is, is, well, let's back up and say, I want to make sure we really understand why elections work in the United States of America. The United States has 8,000 unique jurisdictions at the local level that administer elections. In Texas, we have 254 counties, which are 254 of those 8,000 jurisdictions. We also have some uh, local water and school board, but we'll just stick with 254 for now. And in Texas, each, uh, we have over 10,000 polling locations. So that's 10,000 polls that exist across the state. And at each one of those 10,000 polling locations, there are at least four workers at each one. So that is 40,000 people or 80,000 sets of eyes that are on the process. This is a very low ball number. This does not include all the people that are hired to do ballot by mail. It does not include those at central count. It does not include uh, the early voting ballot board or signature verification committees or the staff of the counties that make those offices run. It does not include the staff at the Secretary of State's office. Uh, that's why when we say uh, elections work, elections work because of all these unrelated sets of eyes at every stage of the process. And we can safely say that there's over 50,000 Texans involved in any given election that are making democracy work. That's 100,000 sets of eyes that are responsible for the legitimacy of our leaders, our government, and our way of life. Now, this decentralization creates checks and balances. And uh, does everybody remember checks and balances from their civics class? All right, just in case, I'm going to put this down. Just in case, I like to do this thing. I remember the Brady Bunch, how the theme music, the people all come in and fill up these nine grids, and this is the Brady Bunch. Well, this is the Brady Bunch of American government. And when you think of checks and balances, I think most people think about the branches of government, right? They think legislative, executive, judicial. And that's super important. But we shouldn't forget about the levels of government, state, local, federal. And they're all watching each other. The 8,000 local governments are checking and balancing the states, the 50 states. Together, those 8,000 and those 50 states are checking and balancing the federal. That's part of why you couldn't have one very powerful federal actor federalize the election and declare himself the winner. There were too many eyes on the process. But the current danger is in the states. So if I'm looking at these three levels, where's the danger at? It's in the states. The erosion is occurring at this moment, at least, in the states. States have wide latitude on setting their own election laws. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Decentralization was the inoculant against authoritarianism this last go around at the federal level. But now there's an attempt to take over the local election apparatus by the states from the local. Taking away the local autonomy of election administrators removes this critical check and balance between state and local governments. And this has to be one of our biggest concerns, right? The challenge is that it involves getting way up in the minutia of implementing an election. Here's the good news. State takeovers are unlikely to happen overnight. Here's why. The big barrier is how expensive it is to administer an election. It's also just very brazen. The bad news is, is that erosion is occurring. 
I'll give you an example. There are all sorts of penalties in these and other bills that are meant to get local election administrators and officials, really, judges as well, to be afraid, to cower. There are, of course, the criminal penalties that are often talked about in the news. Uh, they're scattered throughout the bill. Uh, those are concerning. We are also concerned about the civil lawsuits that are possible, civil penalties. You can see uh, number two in the top ten list, so kind of go into detail about some of those. A third uh, example is the loss of benefits to local government employees. This is a provision we haven't yet talked about in both House Bill 3 and Senate Bill 1, where you could lose your retirement as a punitive thing if you're a local government employee. And then there's financial penalties for failing to do what the state says. This actually passed. It was Senate Bill 1113 by Senator Betancourt. Here's an example of what I mean. So in the voter purge of 2019, the Secretary of State's office said there's 100,000 in that ballpark, 100,000 folks that we think aren't citizens. You need to purge them. The local governments said, we've looked at this, and uh, we think your data is wrong. These are citizens. And they went to court. And the court looked at the facts and said, oh, the locals are correct. It was bad data the state used. Under Senate Bill 1113, the state is allowed to withhold money from local government until the state feels like the local government complied. Think about how long litigation takes. Think about how a state government could choke off a local government by withholding those funds over the course of litigation. This is an extremely concerning bill. Let's talk about how you're going to shore up this bridge, though. We've established there's erosion. Let's talk about how we shore it up. Your local election administrator needs you. The way you protect democratic institutions is you double down on your commitment to those institutions. The most fundamental institution in our society is the local election administrator. Now, what does your local election administrator need you to do? Well, we ask them, and they told us. They tell us that the number one priority that they need, the number one thing they need, is well-trained election workers. Now, in a normal year, and boy, it hadn't been normal for a while, has it? In a normal year, they're, all, they're worried about a shortage of election workers. They're always recruiting. When you add the unpredictability of COVID and now the Delta variant, and then you add the fear that is created by even talking about this kind of legislation, because people are going to get confused what's in this bill. It's a very big bill, and it's going to be very intimidating. And a lot of folks are going to say, I don't want to deal with that, which is the point, right? The local election administrators are super worried. So I want to hammer home why serving as an election worker is not just a good thing, a nice thing to do. It is super strategically important to the survival of democracy. And I want to say it that strongly. Reason number one, your county needs you. And if we're really, I want to say it, your state, your nation, democracy itself needs you. The eyes of the world are on us, the world's oldest democracy. And I want you to sit and think about the volatility of this moment. And then I want you to imagine what happens if a county actually botches an election due to a shortage of election administrators. Reason number two, your community needs you. So if you've been an election judge, you have a thing that is super important in this building and frankly in the world, I think, it's called credibility. Another way you can say is you have lived experience. We live in an era where there is a ton of disinformation. We have a crisis on our hands where people do not know what's true anymore. This empowers flim-flam artists and con men. And in such times, people get hyper-local. Think about masks, and you look around, and what's everybody doing? What is everybody else doing? And you look around at your hyper-local community to see, what, what, what's my neighbor doing? What's, this, this, what's, what's, what's the culture here? I want you to think about your Sunday school class. I want you to think about Thanksgiving dinners. 
I want you to think about your neighborhood associations, social circles like that, really hyper-local ones, right? And every group has that one guy. And that one guy likes to use the F word, fraud. And when that guy starts using the F word, a lot of people clam up. I think most people clam up. I often do. Uh, just, they're not going to argue it. Some people just may not feel confident enough like they know for sure. Some people don't want the emotional experience. Personally, I just don't like banging my head on a wall. Uh, but you need to be able to say, I'm an election judge. That's not how it works. Here's why that could never happen. Now, you're not going to change that one guy's mind. He is not your audience. Your audience is everybody else who can hear. You're inoculating your community against things that aren't true. Reason number three, voters need you. Having enough election judges is critical to voter turnout. If a polling location does not have workers, then it cannot open. Often counties will scramble. They'll send their staff out to try to cover. Um, if they can, they can't always. Even if it opens, it opens late. That means that long lines have built up and long lines disenfranchise. A single mom with childcare issues and a job cannot wait more than 30 minutes. And the forces of voter suppression know this. This is what I mean by the minutia of implementing an election. And I can already hear it. Now, Josh, I, I can't do a 16-hour day. I get it. <laughs> I had to put a hard sell on you because it's that super important, right? But we'd be remiss if we didn't mention other things that you can do too. And this is where I want to get into the difference between, I want to make sure we really understand this, the difference between a poll worker, a poll watcher, and a poll monitor. These are three very different things. A poll worker, which is the critical thing we just talked about, is employed by the county. They administer the election. Poll watchers are appointed by a party or a candidate. They are connected to a campaign. They are partisans. They are supposed to just watch. Now, I hate that I'm about to say what I'm about to say. But if this bill passes, we are probably going to need watchers to watch the watchers. What a mess. Poll monitors, the third thing. They are connected with nonprofits. They are not in the polling location. They are 100 feet outside the electioneering line. And they're just camped out to say, hey, how'd it go? And they're there to, to watch and listen for problems. And if somebody says, here's what happened to me, or the judge did this, or they didn't do this, then their job is to be the eyes and ears of a larger thing called the Election Protection Coalition. It is a national coalition of more than 30 different nonprofit organizations. The Election Protection Coalition has lawyers on standby and a command center. I was one of them. The monitors are our eyes and ears. They call the lawyers on the hotline if they see or hear of problems. And poll monitors are super important if you're able to travel because the people who are organizing this will place you, if you can travel, and they know you can travel, in places of known historic problems, if you get what I'm saying. But I want to reiterate, first and foremost, if you can be an election judge, and get to know your county election administrators and do everything you can to support them, they are priority number 